Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria Online. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the Spiritual Director of the Center and it's a pleasure to see you here with us today. Uh, today being after our Sunday service. And um, I think I'd like to start today with an invocation the way that I do at our Center because I think it's so important for grounding us. So I just invite you to, if it's comfortable for you to close your eyes and just um, be with the presence within uh, for a couple of minutes as I go through this. And know with me that we are drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. And we give thanks to the Esquimalt and Songhees people and whose unceded land we meet today. And here we pray. We pray for the good of all humanity, for it to rise up and for love to awaken in every heart. And today, we hold in highest consciousness those in Atlantic Canada, Florida, South Carolina, and Georgia, those who have suffered staggering loss of property and life in hurricanes this past week, and people of Pakistan, May they find relief from their flooding. Our hearts are open wide to all suffering. We all do what we can and above all else we pray. We pray for their safety, the rebuilding of their lives, for the courage to weather every storm. And we pray for those in war-torn countries that there be peace, that we find peace in our own hearts as they do in theirs, and their lives change. We pray the same prayer for everyone recognizing that God is truly all there is, and this powerful presence has its being in, as, and through each of us and its highest and greatest expression is love. Today we're conscious of all the good around us and also the understanding that unexpected things happen. And when they do, we find our comfort in the energy of the divine that is indwelling in each of us. We acknowledge our oneness with God with the intelligent energy that binds us to one another. We mindfully, prayerfully go forward, knowing that happiness and health and abundance and peace are ours today and forever. For the living Spirit of God is indwelling in each of us. I am so grateful to know that this is so. And so it is. So my theme for this month is living an inspired life. And today's topic, which is part of that, is, is to listen. You know, to, to really listen to the voice, the voice within. In this past week or ten days now, I've been absolutely dumbstruck by the, the power of the winds, the hurricane force, the devastating damage that has been done here in Canada, in um, eastern Canada, the maritime provinces, and in the United States, in Florida and the Carolinas of Georgia. It's difficult to comprehend how so much destruction can take place. And as I was driving home last Tuesday night, I was driving home from town, it was around 6.30, and I was part way out to Sydney and decided to put my radio on. And of course, it, it was on to CBC. And the woman who was the moderator was asking people to call in with their experiences from the hurricane. And I thought, uh-oh, you know, this is going to be more about all of the terrible things that people have experienced. 
and I felt super saturated with it already. I thought, I don't know if I really want to listen to this, but something in me said, listen. And there was a woman who came on. She was an immigrant from, from Thailand, living in Newfoundland. And uh, she said that, I think her house had been destroyed, but she, she had a restaurant, a little cafe, and she specialized in cooking chicken. And she said that she was she went to her restaurant and there was absolutely no power at all. Everything was dark. And she has had gas in her kitchen and the gas lines were uninterrupted. So she turned on the stove and she made herself a chicken dinner in the dark, kind of fumbling her way around. And then she had the thought, if I can do this for one person, I could do this for a hundred. And so she got the word out through a few friends that she was open for business, but she wasn't going to be charging anything. She would make anybody who came in a chicken dinner, and it would be complimentary. Well, at the end of, I guess it was the end of the first full day, she had served 400 meals, 400 complimentary chicken meals to people. And when the moderator of the um, of the, the show asked her why she did this. She said, well, it was the right thing to do. And I smiled at, at that and she said, I will keep on doing this as long as I can. She said, I've already put in an order for more food. Anybody who needs to be fed who doesn't have the money can come here and, and I will prepare a meal for them. And the, the moderator asked her, well, how can you do this? Like, how can you afford to do this? And she said, well, what I'm asking is that anybody who can afford to pay for one meal, send money for one meal so that I can keep on doing this for others. And I, I was in, in tears. I thought, you know, what a beautiful spirit. What, what a beautiful way of rising up above the storm and doing good. And, and sometimes these terrible catastrophes bring out the very best in people. And the stories are wonderful. And one that I particularly loved was a man who called in and he said that his home wasn't damaged. When he went out into the yard, there were lots of puddles of water from the heavy rains. And he saw two little squirrels in a puddle. And one was, you know, thrashing around, trying to get out. And he lifted it up and took it out and it went running off. And the other one was very still, and he lifted it out, and it, it had died. And so he said he held it in his hand, and he just, you know, started pressing on its chest ever so gently, over and over and over again. And after a bit, the little squirrel started to breathe again. And so he took it in the house, and he took a Tupperware container and put one of his old shirts in it, and he put the squirrel in it, and he put some peanuts in it and, and some water and he said, the, the little squirrel slept for 24 hours. Imagine, 24, 24 hours. And then he started to stir and ate a few peanuts and had a bit of water and then went back to sleep. And the next day, he was quite frisky. He was eating the peanuts and, and uh, starting to move around a lot in the Tupperware container. And so, um, so... The men picked him up and took him outside. And he had named him Little Jerry for a friend of his who was invincible. And he put Little Jerry outside, and, and Little Jerry scampered off. And he went back in the house. And he said to the moderator, you know, whenever I go outside, Little Jerry is there. And she said, well, how do you know it's Little Jerry? And he said, oh, because I have a lot of squirrels in my yard. And he said, I always put out peanuts for them. And he said, there's one special stump that I put them out. And he said, there are always four or five squirrels on that stump. And he said, as soon as I go outside, they run off. But he said, this one little squirrel stays. And he said, I can also tell it's little Jerry because he's got a red spot right on top of his forehead. And he's got another one, just a black one rather, um, above his tail. And he said, he never moves when I go out. And I was thinking, you know, that not that the power of love? It's that complete trust. It's knowing that someone cares for you, you care for them, whether it's a human or 
a squirrel, some other kind of animal, no matter what it is, that love transcends everything, makes a person feel safe. They have a safe harbor, shelter from any storm. And they know that from the inside out. And I love that. You know, it might, we might think that, well, feeding 400 people and more is really big. And saving a little scroll is a little thing to do. But in the mind of God, there's no small and there's no big. Everything is the same. And we need to, we need to remember that. Everything is the same. In the end, the thing that is important is that we do the right thing. And I was reading um, Pat and Jelly, who was a philosopher 2,300 years ago. 2,300 years ago. And I want to share this with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had been reading something written um, for a long, long time. When you're inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends your limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed that you could be. He is talking about consciousness 2,300 years ago. You know, we think that we're the discovery um, vehicles for new thought. It's been going on for a long, long time, ancient wisdom. In other words, in times of challenge, whether it's something like a devastating storm or a new project being offered us, our minds expand to embrace the thoughts and ideas that come from our inner guidance. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it happens after deep meditation. And the thing is that we need to allow our minds to do so, to listen, because wonderful things happen when we listen, and that's when we get divine guidance. And when that happens, when we're really listening, suddenly we're in the company of giants and of genius. You know, I remember um, Edison saying that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Well, what if it didn't have to be? What if it could be 99% inspiration and 1% perspiration? What if we could do it an easier way? And there is that easier way. And it's when we, you know, we sweep aside everything that we've ever been taught since we were born. And we listen. And we live in a can-do world of, I can, yes, I can, yes, I can, yes, I can. Norman Vincent Peale, who was a student of Ernest Holmes, our founder, said, I can do anything through God that strengtheneth me. Anything through God that strengtheneth me. In the stillness, we find God. In the stillness, we are at home. We feel completely at home with the divine. In the stillness, there are many answers. We simply have to listen. Rumi, the wonderful poet, wrote, I have been a seeker, and I still am. And I stopped asking the books and the stars, and I started listening to the teachings of my soul. I'm going to read that again. I have been a seeker, and I still am. But I stopped asking the books and the stars, and I started listening to my own soul. All of the truth, all of the intelligence, everything we need to know is inside us. That's what we're taught. When we listen, we know. And there's a wonderful minister of our faith named Dr. William Curtis, and he wrote the following. The reason that many people do not listen to the voice is because they do not hear or recognize it. Their concept of God is that of a being separate from them. You know, the old man on the cloud who sits there and judges us for what we're doing wrong or what we're doing right, and who will punish us for what we've done, what we've done wrong. Not our God. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
They're not expecting an inner voice, and they're not receptive to it. Besides, the voice of intuition can appear to be contrary to, to reason and is disregarded. Yeah. How can you not recognize the voice if you don't know what it is? And if you're not receptive, and if you think that your ego mind is going to take care of everything. When we truly accept that we are both spirit and human, truly accept and know, <clears throat> excuse me, and know it at a deep and abiding level, then it stands to reason that if we stop struggling and listen to spirit within, we will find an inner prompting, a calling, a guidance about what to do next. And we will be given intuitive messages to follow. And when we do, our greatest dreams can be realized. So, how about you? Do you live in a can-do or can't-do place in life? You know, the, the can't-do lacks inspiration and has to look for it. You know, little Jerry or someone in history who wouldn't take no for an answer. And we have to look for the divine gift in any situation, in anything we're going through that is troubling us, that is, that is putting us into a place of chaos, of anguish, of anxiety. You know, we have to look for that divine gift. I was um, talking to our, to our practitioner class on Wednesday of last week. And, and I was saying, you know, it doesn't have to be hard. You know, we have this concept that everything has to be difficult, or a lot of things have to be difficult in our lives. And I learned this a long, long time ago. I learned it before email, before the internet, and before I got into the teachings of science of mind. I didn't know about them at all. And I was working on a big international festival that I did each year with a wonderful group of people in support. And I found that, you know, I, I was in touch with people all over the world every day. And I found that I was on the telephone all day because I would start early in the morning on, on the phone to Europe or, or to Asia or to Australia. And then, then I would, you know, as the day went on, I would move into different time zones with my calls. And I would have a, a, a black bound book uh, um, of, that, where I kept my notes. And every time I thought of something else I had to do, I would just make a quick note of it. And typically by the end of the week, I would have pages of notes. I can remember once starting to number them and I would be up in, in the 150s of things to do. And when I got to Friday, I would think, oh, I haven't accomplished anything. You know, I've got to go through my to-do list and move things over to Monday. So I'd start going through the list. And what I discovered was that Things had already taken care of themselves that I didn't have to do them. And it was, it was like a miracle. It was magical to me. And that one example that I can give that was huge, there were many, but one that I can give that was huge was I had made a note that I would like to have Sony come and demonstrate high-definition television at our festival. Now, it was long before the days of high-definition def high television being... Um, something that was commonplace. And, you know, a screen for HDTV took up a wall of an entire room. So imagine shipping that from, from Japan, uh, from Sony of Japan to Banff, Alberta, and sending technicians to set, to set everything up and to run the demonstrations to show them to people. Imagine what that would cost. You know, probably at the time it was $100,000, maybe 150000 much more in today's dollars. Anyway, I had made that note. I wanted Sony to do this. And I was going to call the head of Sony um, and the head of um, the National Network in Japan to see what could be arranged. Anyway, when I got to that note in my book, I smiled because the head of Sony had called me during the week and had asked if Sony could come to our festival and demonstrate HDTV. Well, of course I said yes, but when I looked at this in my notebook, I thought, you know, there's no need to worry about anything. 
You know, this festival was destined to be. Everybody said it was magic. People who attended it said it was magic. And it was this magic, these miracles that were happening all the time. But what happened was I had let go of worrying about whether or not we could accomplish things, whether or not we would have a big enough budget, whether or not we would raise enough money. And as soon as I released those worries, everything started to happen and everything was taken care of. It doesn't mean I still wasn't working. I was on the phone every day, all day. But it, it was, it was, life was made easier. I didn't have to carry it around with me all the time. I didn't take it to bed with me at night. It wasn't occup occupying my dreams. And so I was suggesting to our class, and I've suggested this in other classes I've taught before, that they take a notebook and fold a page in half. And on the left side, they put, what is mine to do? And they make a list of, of all the things they have to do. And then on the right side, what is God's to do? And make a list of the things that they think they can't do themselves. And of course, Ernest Holmes said, you know, all we need to know is the what. God takes care of the how. God takes care of the details. Now that might be through us, through divine inspiration, um, through other people calling and saying, I'm going to do this or I would like to do this. There are all kinds of ways that these things can happen. But we need to be open to this. We don't need to make it difficult for ourselves. Not ever. You know, when we're living in a place where we know that these gifts are ours by our birthright, wonderful things start to happen. And I was thinking of one of, you know, again with inspiration, how I'm inspired almost every day by something. And I was reading a story a long time ago that has really stuck with me. The story of a, a farmer, named his last name is Fleming, and he he was the father of Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. And Farmer Fleming was out in his fields, and there was a pond nearby, and he heard something, somebody screaming, and he looked, and there was a little boy who was trying to avoid drowning. And Farmer Fleming went and leapt in the water and saved the little boy, took him home, got him dried out. And the next day... Uh, a nobleman rode up to his house, he was riding on a horse, rode up to his house, got out of, got off the, the horse, knocked on the door, and Farmer Fleming was home, it was in the evening, and he said, you saved the life of my son yesterday, and he said, I want to give you some money for that, and Farmer Fleming said, oh no, no, I, I, would, I couldn't take money for that, I just did the right thing. And the nobleman said, he noticed that Farmer Fleming had a son, and he said, then you must let me pay for the education of your son. I could have lost mine, but let me pay for the education of your son. And Farmer Fleming could not ignore that, could not refuse that, because he knew that he could never do that for his boy. And so he thanked the nobleman, and he agreed. Anyway... Alexander Fleming went to the best schools, the best universities, and it was he who discovered um, penicillin, which has saved so many lives. Now, it happened that at that time, just after the discovery, Sir Winston Churchill contracted pneumonia, and he was very seriously ill. And he was given penicillin, and it saved his life. I think, what a different world we might have lived in if Winston Churchill hadn't been Winston Churchill during the war, the Second World War. But here's the thing that is really, really miraculous that makes you wonder about destiny, about fate, about karma, about whatever. And that's that the little boy that Farmer Fleming saved was Winston Churchill as a boy. Beautiful, beautiful example of what goes around comes around. God in action at the highest level. I mean, that, that story just, it gave me chills right through to the bone, God bumps, <laughs> when I read it a long time ago, and it has never, ever gone away. You know, we have these inner instincts in us. Sometimes it's something instant, like Fleming, and other times characters built through 
silent meditation and prayer and we are shaped into the right person at the right time in our history in our daily lives you know, and how do we know that we're doing the right thing how do we know that we're listening to this inner voice that we're listening to this calling as Wayne Dyer said we know it because it feels good when it feels good we're living an inspired life and so I suggest that we look for inspiration all along the way. The other night, I, I think it was Saturday night, I had finished working and I uh, turned on my television set and I had recorded a Stephen Colbert show from days before and I hadn't watched it. And I don't typically record it, but something called me to, to do that. And there was um, an astrophysicist who was on the show. His name is Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson. And I sat there absolutely mesmerized, my jaw dropping some of the time. And he had a, a, a photograph, or Stephen Colbert had a photograph, that was taken from the telescope that the Americans sent out one million miles into space. It took five years to get there. And the telescope works, and it was strong enough to see the end of the universe. And what, what was collected was this, in this beautiful photograph, enormous photograph that looked like a cloud and it was kind of orange and it had light, you know, around it as well and through it. And it had these little dots of light within it. And Neil Tyson said, that's the nursery for the stars and the planets. He said, that's how they're formed, in this gaseous cloud. And I was dumbstruck because I have so often wondered, well, what does the end of the universe look like? And it simply looks like creation, more and more creation. But it's astonishing today what science can do. And I felt so inspired by that. And as he, he went on speaking, um, you know, he, he, he said, it was toward the end of, end of the interview, and this man is so excited about everything and, and so exciting and inspired that, you know, you can't help but just grin from ear to ear listening to him. And again, I'm going to tell you his name in case you haven't seen this, or you might look up the, the, the Stephen Colbert show uh, by Googling it. It's Neil deGrasse, that's capital D-E-G-R-A-S-S-E, Tyson, T-Y-S-O-N. And he's just written a new book, which I have ordered, uh, because a lot of the information that he was giving to Stephen Colbert is in the book, and of course much more. But at the end of the interview, he said, you know, maybe Elon Musk has a space bus in his garage. Not a spaceship, a space bus. And he said, maybe we could take all of the leaders in the world who are into to fighting with one another, into doing no good at all, and put them in that space bus and send them to the moon. Because he said, when, when you get to the moon and you look back, all you see is this beautiful blue planet Earth. You see the oceans, you see the land masses. And he said, you don't see individual beings, you don't see borders anywhere. You realize how much we are all one and how connected we are one to the other, and how we are connected to this earth. And he said, you can't fight. You can't want to fight when that happens. And I was remembering when America put the first astronauts on the moon, and when they came back, Gene Hewson was the great anthropologist, was called in to debrief them, because NASA was not being very successful at it. And she worked with them over a period of weeks, and at the end she said, they left the earth as scientists and they came back as spiritual beings. No one could look at this beautiful planet from outside without feeling the presence of God. And I remember hearing back then at 1970, I guess it was, um, it was 1969, um, I remember hearing um, that 
in China, every Chinese who had a little had a home of any kind had a picture of Mao on the wall. They cut, they worshipped Mao, and all of those photographs came down, and instead, photographs of planet Earth were placed on the wall, and they began to worship planet Earth. We have to hold these things in our hearts. You know, space travel, seeing the, seeing the end of the universe, continuing to create. Imagining what it's like to see the planet from far, far away outside. You know, these are enormous, enormous parts of our inspiration. And the thing is, once again, there is no small, no large, no gigantic, no enormous in the mind of God. There's simply the right thing. So what is your right thing to do? You'll know when you feel good. And when you listen to that voice and follow it, chances are pretty good that you're going to be feeling good. And do you want it to be one part inspiration and 99% perspiration, or 1% one per one perspiration and 99% inspiration? I'll take the latter, thanks. Listening to your inspiration to the divine within you is what tells you what to do. And so it is. Thank you for being here today and for listening to this message. And I'd like to remind everybody that next Sunday, which is Thanksgiving Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday not Thanksgiving Day, but Thanksgiving Sunday, that our Center for Spiritual Living is having um, a turkey potluck. It'll be an absolute feast. It always is. And if you would care to join us, please do. We're in the Cook Street Village Activity Center at 380 Cook Street, um, Cook Street Village, Victoria, and we would love to welcome you there. Our service begins at 11 in the morning, but we do have a meditation service at 1030 if you care to join us for that. And afterward, it's just going to be the most wonderful meal. We do this every year. And uh, we would love to have you join us. And you can enter through the front door at 380 Cook Street. Um, and don't let the building fool you. Um, it's, uh, it, there's a sign up that says Wellness Center, and that sometimes confuses people. We do put out our own sign that says Center for Spiritual Living, but sometimes people see the wellness one first and they can't find us. So just know that you're in the right place when you see that. And we'd love to have you join us for the service and join us for food afterward and just to get to know us. Bless you. Have a wonderful week and may your hearts be filled with gratitude as we approach this special celebration this year. Bye for now. <laughs>